So let me, uh, I'm just going to put up the screen for today. We, uh, I, I prayed about this uh, quite some time ago. I always do before going on vacation about, you know, the fall. That's one of the reasons why I, I really appreciate this time off. I was telling some people this morning is not only to rest, uh, which is very much needed, uh, but also to have the time to, to pray and ask God, okay, where next? What, what, what does our body need? What does our church need? Um, what do I need for that matter as part of this body, right? And uh, it was really, really encouraging to me um, last um, July, beginning of July, and the Lord put something on my heart uh, for this time, this last two weeks before we jump into the fall, and it's a mini-series here on, quote, the Bible. Can you imagine? Two weeks and we're going to talk about the Bible, obviously in a condensed way, but in a specific way as well. I have a little short video I want to play for you at first just to kind of Set the tone, set the pace, all right? Have a look at this video and, and listen. I hope you'll be able to all hear it. Have I ever read the Bible? No. I haven't read the Bible. For my own reasons, no. I've skimmed it. I have read the Bible. I kind of looked at little segments, but I've never actually attempted to read, read the whole thing. <laughs> it's not advertised enough but I don't go to church so the time when I do read it is when I'm in church but other than that I don't have a copy of the Bible. But, yeah. They're interesting stories like as a guide for people how to live not necessarily taken literally. I thought it was daunting. It's just it's been a long time so I don't really remember everything. Story of Adam and Eve. Yeah Adam and Eve. Like stories about uh, Jesus yeah. and his life. Up there. Of course there's Genesis. I don't know the difference between sort of like the different books and stuff. Um, but I do know Genesis is the first one. Or is that an argument? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I really like him. So yeah, that's just taken from the, uh, the Alpha course, the Alpha series that we've run here at the Rock Church and all over the world. And uh, I, I think it's kind of funny. It's interesting, eh? Like, it, obviously, it's filmed in London, and they're, they're British, right? And they've got subtitles. Right? Okay, so... that. <laughs> That, that was for us here in Canada. I took that off of another church's website that had, had played that. And uh, yeah, so listen, I, I want to answer a few questions. Why, why are we doing this? Why would we be doing this series uh, called the Bible? Why would God put this on my heart? What, what's the point? What's going on here? Um, the, the thought first occurred to me, as I suggested to you, early in July. I, I like to put out, you know, uh, early in the summer, some recommended reading for those of you who are, you know, somewhat serious, right? So you remember that? Remember that? All of you bought some of those books, right? Come on, put up your hands. No, none of you probably did, right? Here's one of the books that I, I recommended. It's a book called Not What You Think, Why the Bible Might Be Nothing We Expected But Everything We Need. And I, I heard about this book from another pastor, and I downloaded it, and I read it, and I recommended it to you because it's really, really good. So this was kind of the impetus for this series. This book is written uh, by a husband and wife team, both around 30, 31 when they wrote it. So they are, quote, millennials, right? Uh, their names are Michael and Lauren McAfee. They both have seminary degrees, extensive seminary degrees in biblical studies, and they, f they felt compelled to write this book for a couple of reasons. And the first was because they, they had been to secular university besides Bible colleges and seminaries, and they had a lot of non-Christian friends. And, and their, their hope was, because they knew, just like in this video, they knew that most of their friends, unchurched friends, even though they had opinions about the Bible, had never read it, had never really read it. Little snippets, Adam and Eve, right? And, and so they, they really wanted to write this for them, to encourage them. It, is, it maybe isn't what you think. You should, you should read this. It's a really good book. But also they wanted to write this for their Christian friends, many of whom they had seen over the past several years buckling under the cultural pressure about the Word of God, about what Christians apparently believe, and then again, specifically to their fellow millennials. And I found this book really, really helpful for a couple of reasons. One, I've said this several times as a pastor. Some of you who are millennials will hopefully appreciate this. I think they get a bad rap. I mean, I'm from the baby boomer generation. And listen, we were the first rebels and the first entitled, okay? You do not deserve that moniker, okay? <laughs> Every generation that comes from the beginning of time since Adam and Eve 
has been mocked by the older generation. Amen? Right? They're lazy. They don't do anything. They rebel, you know. And so this is one of the reasons why they wanted to write this book, is they wanted to be able to encourage their fellow millennials. I would encourage every one of you here today who is, frankly, a baby boomer, an older person, read this book. It would be very helpful for you and your attitude about young men and women in our culture today uh, who do not know Jesus, who do not read the Bible. Because is that not our hope? <laughs> what else have you got to share but the gospel and the word of God with them? And so it's, a, it's about connecting. So let me give you a couple of other reasons why I, I feel it's just a really good idea for a couple of weeks to look at the subject of the Bible, the Bible in particular. First, it's, it's a pattern uh, for the past two or three years as I've had these wonderful breaks uh, that when I do come back, you've got these two weeks before you, f- you jump into the fall season, right? So I'm always like, well, what am I going to talk about, you know, for two weeks before we get into the Gospel of Luke again or wherever we are? And so it's been a pattern here at the Rock Church for the last several years that I y- typically do a series called The Church for two weeks. And the reason why we do that is, is twofold. One is um, for those of you who are new at the Rock Church— here for the summer and, and or the last six months to a year. It's a good opportunity uh, for us to give you a little bit of background about, A, who we are as a church, uh, what we believe the Scripture calls the church to do and be, right? And, and some of the things we believe, and then therefore maybe you want to hear that message and still come or not come, right? Uh, but we want to be straight up front, so we will tell that. But it, it's, it's also for regular members and attenders of The Rock for five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Why? Well, it's, come on, it's summer. You guys have forgotten about what it means to be, uh, you know, a church-going Christian, and, and it's, it's, it's a reset. It's a good opportunity for us to, to have a bit of a reboot about the mission, why we're doing this. Why, on a beautiful sunny day, are you here today and going to be here every Sunday for the next six months? Amen? Hello? I don't know. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why we do that. But this year, the question has to be, why the Bible? Well, I already gave you a part of that answer because of that book that was a, a motivating factor for me. But, but it's also this related to who we are as a church. And you need to know this if you want this to be your, your church home or continue to be your church home. We are a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church, full stop. That's who we are as a church. So if you're new here, that's what we do every Sunday. We, we open the Bible... We go through books of the Bible, verse by verse, reading it. I do my very best to give you the context, the background, the information, what the author's original intent was, what the original audience probably heard, what they heard the author saying, what the Holy Spirit, based on the context of all of Scripture, is is saying in that text. And then finally, what does that mean for us today? We as preachers do our best job to do that behind the Word of God. So that's who we are as a church. We do that. Then what we do as a church is we gather here on Sunday, and then we scatter throughout the week to be missional and share the gospel with other people, but also to meet in missional community groups, which will start up again in September. And the main purpose for us doing that is is that I'm going to say things today. I say things every Sunday, and some of you are going to go home and go, I'm not sure I got that, (laughs) right? Or I'm not even sure I agree with that, or wow, I need some more help with that. We're like, and, and so what, the purpose of our missional community groups is to get together. And, and listen, I want to be clear here, church. It's not to get together and talk about what you did or didn't like about the sermon. Okay? That's not the point. No. The point is to go deeper into the Word of God. And the point actually is in community to ask the question, what did the Holy Spirit say to me in that message? How did the Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God, cut me to the heart and reveal in my life my own personal sin? That's how you grow. That's how we grow. And so that's what we do. We, we, we gather as a Bible-teaching and Bible-believing church, um, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this series is to be able to tell you about that. And so if you're looking at the Rock Church as a church, I, great, we're glad to have you. That's how over the last 10 years we have grown into being a church that has, is going to two services and we're looking for a new building. Is, is a, it's not because of me or because of the coffee, although that is awesome. It's because of the Word of God, amen? It's all I've got, guys. 
It's all I've got. And I want to hopefully encourage you today, it's really all you've got. And it's all you need is the Word of God itself. And so a third reason for doing this today is for the skeptic, the critic, you know, who may be watching right now or maybe the people you know. So, so it, it's for you too, Christian, so that maybe you will be able to have some languaging that, that you can share with your skeptic, unbelieving friend. That's part of my hope in doing this series today. I want to encourage you. You saw in that clip, right? Uh, they, these are mostly young quote, millennial, maybe some Gen Zs in there, but young British men and women. And, and th- wasn't it pretty clear when you watched that? I hope you saw that. They were, they were being nice and all the rest of it, not overly critical. But the bottom line was is that they never really read the Word of God. They, they, they virtually had no clue. Now, that's not being critical of them. That, as an ex-marketing guy in business, I would call that an opportunity. But I think what often, often happens in our, in our culture, particularly in the church, is we look at that and we go, oh, you know, you know, those kids, those people, you know. No, no. They, they, they need to be introduced to the Bible. But not the way maybe some of us in the church have been introduced to it in the past, right? <laughs> That's something I hope we will learn about today. I noticed when we, uh, we put up our posters in the ledge and we put up the, the picture of... Uh, this uh, graphic on Facebook as an ad to say, hey, come on, come on. I'm going to do that over and over again. I'm an animated guy. Um, to, you know, come, you know, to the service or watch online. And, you know, there was a, a number of people who liked it, right? And, yeah, I'm coming. And, yeah, that's awesome. But there were some people who, you know, added their LOL, you know, or an LOL crying emoji, right? And, and basically mocking the idea of the Bible. Seriously? You're going to get together and you're going to... You're going to, oh my goodness, isn't this, I mean, if you open it and and blow on it, isn't dust going to come out, right? Yes, so we want to do that series for them today too. And hopefully encourage some of them that maybe it's not what you think it is. Maybe it's time for not just another look, but a real look at the Bible. Now there's a fourth reason. Uh, This one's challenging to a certain extent, but the fourth reason is because I, as a pastor and the elders of our church, any church leaders who are at all aware of what's going on in our culture, hello, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. Um, Many, many people today in the church are very concerned about a couple things. Number one, many people in the church who gather to church in church on Sundays are not reading their Bibles, right? Every Sunday I go, open your Bibles, please. And most of you are, remain in the exact same position you're in right now. One of my fa- favorite Babylon Bee uh, articles, it's a Christian satire website, is, is a, a picture of a lonely Bible sitting on a, uh, a railing in a house. And the Bible is, uh, the husband's running around the house going, Honey, have you seen my Bible? And she says, Yes, it's where you left it when you got home from church last Sunday. <laughs> and the Bible's kind of crying. It's not only that, though. It's this. The Word of God is under attack in our world and our culture more than ever. It's been under attack since did God really say in Genesis chapter 3. Amen? But it's under attack in a very nefarious way in our day and our age today. And it is, it is, it is leading a lot of young men and women to not so much lose their faith. If you're a Christian and you've been saved, you cannot lose your faith. But it's causing many, many, many to walk away from the church and from their faith and therefore be functionally dead in their life as a Christian in this world today. It's under a lot of attack. And so that brings me to this. Um, This is not to impress you, by the way, but this is part of my library. When when I first started preaching about 25 years ago, even in my business life, like the goal of every preacher, pastor, is you had to have a big library in your home, right? And the main reason, by the way, that you needed that is when people came over and they saw how many books you had, they were like, this guy's legit, right? Most of them were never read. You know, they were written 400 years ago. They had dust in them, right? So these are actually from my personal library. Now, today I have... Uh, most pastors today have a, a Bible software called Logos. I have it on my computer. 
Uh, and I do 90% of my study using Logos, and I have actually 2,200 books, resources, and reference materials on Logos. I don't read them all for every message, but I research through them. These are part of my personal library that I've kept, and, and, I, and here's the news. <laughs> I, I have actually read all of these. Now, this one I just got three weeks ago, so I'm only like a third of the way in, but I want to tell you, this book is called The Doctrine of God by John Frame, and in this book, 800 pages, he deals with the first chapter of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, which is only about 150 pages, called The Doctrine of God. And so I, I point this out, and this Systematic Theology, by the way, by Wayne Grudem, it's one of the more popular today. I've got four of them by different people. Um, I've actually been through a seminary master's level course on this um, Systematic Theology book twice, uh, not because I failed the first time, uh, but... <laughs> Just saying, no, the first time was in seminary. Second time, there was a, a pastor in Vancouver who I deeply respected who was going to go through it. And, and he wanted to go through it with other pastors, preachers, from a pastoral perspective, which was awesome. It was really, really awesome. So I, I show it to you for this reason. Let me do this. Now, you can imagine, these are books, these are all about the Bible, how to interpret the Bible, how to read the Bible, what the doctrines of the Bible are. They're dramatically and radically similar not in every single area, but on the key aspects of our faith, of the Bible, they are unified. But what we have happening in our culture today over the past eight years in particular is four or five different authors. Um, This is not one of those authors' books. Uh, I have purchased three of the books in question, and I've read them because I want to be able to know what I'm talking about if I'm going to be, quote, critical and, quote, protective. Um, and, and so I have them on my uh, Kindle, um, and I actually went to Chapters, Indigo, pardon me, and, and was going to buy one of them because I wanted to be able to use it as this illustration, but I decided, you know what? I'm not putting $20 into a book that I think is really a waste of time. <laughs> okay, that wasn't very nice. But this is about the same thickness as that book. And what the author in that book had done, look at this, is he would basically said in a book that size, yes, Everything that these people have said and theologians for the past three to 400 years have said and written about the Bible, they got it wrong. They're totally wrong. They don't understand the Bible. A lot of young men men and women in the church today are reading books like this and listening to authors of books like this. There's, There's a pattern. I won't go into it with you today about how they write, but that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. Because it's a great concern for any pastor when someone rejects the Bible. And that's what books like this are doing. And they're doing that so that they can comfort us when it comes to interacting with what the culture believes to be true. And the Bible says the opposite. So there's a fourth reason. It's because of, well, that's the fourth reason, pardon me. The last reason is this, and it has to do with our outline for the two-part series, and it is this. Uh, Today, I hope to show you that the Bible is this. It is the story of God. It's the story of God. The whole thing, front, cover to cover, is the story of God. And then next week, I hope to show you that it is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And so that's the final reason for doing it today is that my hope is, our hope as leaders at this church is, more than anything else, more than all of those other reasons, is that you will leave here today and you will, you will treasure this. This as the most life-giving, life-changing collection of books you can read. And you'll start reading it for that reason again every day. So today... I'm going to pray one more time, but I'll show you our outline for today. The Bible, the story of God, I want to show you three things. Who he is, what he has done, what he's still going to do. It's amazing. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you one more time for this opportunity to be here. Lord Jesus, you are the word. Holy Spirit, you are the one who has inspired all of this. We pray for your presence with us here today, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak. You would speak through the words that you've given to me, but most importantly, you would speak through the word to every one of us gathered here today, to myself, even at this point, afresh. I pray you would bless us and encourage us. I pray you would do what you do, which is speak. You speak. We can hear you. So I pray that we would hear you in a dramatic way today. 
Amen. So guess where we're going? We're going to look at the story of God. Where do you think we should start? Genesis chapter 1. Let me read you the first five verses of Genesis chapter 1, and then we're going to unpack them a little bit this morning. The author says, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So again, you may remember from the video clip that we looked at, this is point number one, by the way, who God is. Remember from the video, there was a a few of the young people there, um, they they knew, right? They they knew Genesis was the first book of the Bible. They knew that, right? And and, and some of them probably knew that the way it even started, I'm going to make a very bold statement to you. I can't verify this. You maybe want to go check it on Google or somewhere else, but I'm going to suggest this to you. And it's a bold statement, but there's a reason why I want to make it. Uh, I I would suggest to you that in the English-speaking word, everybody knows that. And so when the Bible declares, Christian, that before Jesus comes again, the goal of the Great Commission is that we are to take the Word of God to the ends of the earth. And I would suggest it's not even just the English-speaking language. We have folks here who are Korean and other languages. I wonder how many people know that, that the Bible starts in the book of Genesis. But I would also suggest that they know this. It starts with these three words, right? In the beginning. In the beginning. And so um, anyone who studies literature, um, anyone who studies literature is is basically going to say, well, This is likely, those three words are likely the best known, most classic introduction to a narrative in all of history. You know, maybe on a dark and stormy night would be number two, right? If you read fiction, but that's what that is, right? You know when you read on a dark and stormy night that you're reading fiction, don't you? Like, you know, something bad is going to happen, right? And, And there's going to be some story and some resolution, usually about... Redemption, which is very interesting. Every story seems to model the story of God. And so that intro, of course, is fiction, but the intro that we see here is far from that. Even though there are people who say, come on, (laughs) that's really what it is. Why do I say that? Well, because of the very next word. The very next word is in the beginning, God. This is not a work of fiction, right? This, this, is, this is actually the author is beginning and saying, no, 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 no. Listen, this book is about someone. It's the story of God. One of my favorite uh, authors who wrote Mere Christianity. Most of you know him. He's quoted by pastors all the time. It's really safe to quote C.S. Lewis, right? He's a great writer. He's a brilliant man. He was an atheist who came to faith in Jesus Christ through his relationship with J.A.R. Tolkien and the Holy Spirit, of course. And one of the things he said, now he was a linguistic and narrative, a poet, a a fantasy writer, just he was a scholar when it came to literature. And one of the things that clued him in right away, that wait a second, and as he started reading the Bible for himself, was that he started reading this, he's going, no, 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 no. This is thousands of years old, and listen, this this doesn't have any of the earmarks of either fiction or fantasy. It has the earmarks of real news, real word. And so it starts with, in the beginning, God. And so that's why I say, in the first four words, we we, we learn that this story is about a person. It's about God. So I want to pause for just a minute and talk about some of the specifics of of what, in fact, this is, right? And again, I, I think it's really important. We've been over this. If you've been at The Rock before, you're going to go... Old news, Glenn, I heard you talk about this before. I'm going to repeat it, okay, for you, but for others who haven't, is that because, listen, Christian, we, we, uh, we're, we're talking into a culture and a world today where a lot of the things we say that we have come to understand and say, it, 
it's not understood by people in our culture, so we need to be actually accurate. And so what is this, this simulated leather thing I have here, right? Well, some people would say it's a book. I understand the Bible is a book. Actually, no. It's a collection of 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors that we know of, and usually I say 40-plus authors because there's one or two books. Hebrews is a very good example where the author neither identifies himself nor is it clear who it is. Now, scholars believe it's the Apostle Paul. I would lean that way too just because of the language, and he is Jewish, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, writing to his brothers and sisters, his fellow Hebrews, his fellow Jews, but it's not clear. Now, this first book of the Bible, this book Genesis, of course, is written, and all scholars, all scholars agree that it is written by Moses, the man of God who wrote the Pentateuch, uh, which is the Greek name or Greek word for the Hebrew word Torah, right, which is the five, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so Moses wrote these books. He wrote them all. Now, here's an important point, though. The truth is, and again, critics will go, huh, right? Moses wrote these books somewhere around 1500, 1450 B.C., obviously when he was alive. He wrote these books. And, and he's writing about, in some cases, events that happened at least 3,500 to up to 5,000 years before his time. Right? Now, how, why do I say that? Well, because, again, if you, if you go back in the Bible through genealogies and generations and people, you're going to get back to, again, about 3,500, somewhere between that and 5,000 years before. And so the question has to be, Moses, where did, where, did you, where did you get this stuff in the beginning of the God? And God said, where did you get that? It's a good question. <laughs> and again, there's a lot of Jewish history. There's a lot of scholarly evidence for this. But the reality is it came from two places. Oral tradition. Now, some of us today, we know the old story about the telephone, right? You hear something, you pass it on to the next person, next person. By the time it gets to the next person, it's, a, it's about something completely different. It wasn't that way back then. Oral tradition was incredibly important. It was all they had, for the most part, in order to keep stories for being told throughout Horse history. But there's a second point. Not only oral history, but again, the Bible itself confirms, Moses confirms, through something called, here it is, inspiration. The Holy Spirit speaking to Moses and saying, yeah, Moses, listen, um, and God said, this is what I said. And Moses hearing that and writing that. So, of course, as soon as non-Christians or skeptics hear that, it's go, okay, that's kind of (laughs) airy-fairy. Like, really? Really? Yes. Yes. There is a metaphysical world out out there. Yes, there is a God. That's what the Bible teaches us. This is the one we want you to get to know, and we want you to get to know him this week through his own story, his story, right? There's a few ways that we know this. I I could actually go through 15 to 20 reasons, but I'm going to give you a couple today. One of them is is really clear, and again, C.S. Lewis made this point. You read through these these, 40, these 66 books written by over 40 different authors, many of whom didn't even know each other, lived, lived in different parts of the world, you know, and, it, and it's over this long period of time. And here's the thing. You read it and you read it and you read it and you're like, it's incredibly, incredibly consistent. The same thing over and over again. And it wasn't because they'd read each other. Many of these books weren't available to all of them, but they're being moved by the word of God, by God himself, to write, and these things become written. (laughs) Secondly is because of this, and I want to show you something on screen, actually a couple things, just as evidences to inspiration. Now, again, for those of you who have a Luddite version, you know, a printed version of the Bible, you might recognize this. Now, this is uh, my lovely ESV Bible I took a picture of the other day. You notice those little circles there? So, so in every Bible, starting, and there's the verses that I read this morning, every Bible has those little A's, B's, and C's, right? Now, you know what those are, don't you? Anybody know what they are? Oh, speak up. Come on. They're references, right? Cross-references, right? Every Bible has them. Now, they're not in the original translation. So again, how do they get there? Scholars, <laughs> people who've studied the Bible for centuries over and over have noticed something. There's something written here, and oh, it 
it's relevant over here. It's, a, it's about the same thing. And then it's over there too. And then it comes back. And it, it's amazing. It's amazing. These references are very, very important because they are, again, evidence that not just men wrote a fictional story. A God, a being, played a very, very important role. I'm going to show you a graphic on screen that really makes this point. I remember seeing this a few years ago, and it's awesome. It, a, a few scholars got together, and they were like, okay, how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we show people what this whole reference thing, how critical it is, how important it is, and how beautiful it is to, to the veracity that the Bible can be trusted and believed? Well, they came up with this graphic. It's a little hard to see uh, from the screen. I'm going to put it up on our website so you can actually open it up in the, the largest graphic version and take a really good look at it. But basically what they did, they, they took the 63,000 references that are in the Bible, and on the top part, you, the different colors are dependent on, on how far in between the books the, the reference is. And so the colors change depending on how far the reference is in the Bible. And what do, you, what do we see here, which is really remarkable, and it's completely unexplainable related to any other sacred text in the world, is the whole thing links. 66 books, 1,500 years, 40 plus different authors. Down along the bottom, you really can't see it very well, but all of those little lines down the bottom are actually every little book of the Bible. And then the lines going this way are how many verses are in each chapter. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm actually going to over and highlight it for you because it's so exciting. Look at this. There's one line here. Do you see that line there? Anybody know uh, what chapter of the Bible that is? Because it's the longest chapter of the Bible. What is it? Psalm 119. Psalm 19. Give this man a star right over here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sunday school teacher right there. I love it. Uh, that's what it is. Come on. Am I the only one excited here? This is remarkable. It's remarkable stuff. And if, if you read the Bible, if you actually read it and let it read you, your mind will not only be blown away and expanded, but opened up by the Holy Spirit of God to the truth. And so Moses begins with, in the beginning, God. Listen, he doesn't begin in the beginning. Okay, wait a second. I'm going to have to back up a little bit here and give a little bit of a seminary class and just explain metaphysically the rationale for a God and and evolution creation. And let's go through all of that stuff first. It's just an emphatic declaration. In the beginning, God. That's how he starts. In the beginning, God. It's remarkable, really, how he goes about it. So in that one word, he tells us, listen, in that one word, he tells us a lot about who God really is. And this is where, like, you know, uh, uh, geeky people like myself get really crazy over theology and go really deep in it. And I've got to share some of it with you today because it's exciting, but it's important to understand. The Hebrew word that is used there for God is really the key. It is the word Elohim. Now, most of us, we just go by that in the beginning, God. Okay, keep going, right? But but, but right there, the Holy Spirit through Moses is giving us an incredible clue by the use. He could have used other words in the Hebrew language for gods or God or whatever. He used Elohim. And the important point for me to establish for you right now is that it when we hear the word God in our English language, at first blush, it doesn't tell us anything. Elohim tells us this. It's an unusual word to be using in the beginning, God, because it is a plural word. Not as in many gods, but this God is somehow a plurality. We're four words in. We're four words into the Bible, and this is already being revealed. The rest of the verse goes like this, and you all know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now, we're five words in, and guess what? We've arrived at the very first miracle in the Bible. Why do I say miracle? Well, well, let me ask you a question. How do you explain something coming from nothing? Because that's what that word created literally means. Uh, there was a, originally the Roman Catholic Church did one of the first major translations of the Bible was in Latin. And the Latin phrase that is used for created is a great, great word 
two words actually, well, one, one a prefix, to, to explain the Hebrew word for created. And it is the prefixed word ex nihilo. And what it literally means is out of nothing. God created the heavens of the earth out of nothing. Let me be really clear here. This word is only used in the Bible related to God. Why? Because he is the only being who can create something out of nothing. I I often chuckle sometimes when I hear people go, hey, do you want to see my latest creation? You know, their artwork or whatever. Listen, we're creative people. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. We'll see that this morning. But by the same token, we don't create anything, kids. We make things from existing materials that God created out of nothing. Amen? Okay, maybe you don't know that right so far. Maybe that's news to you. This is who God is. This is who we're actually talking about today. And so it's really important. If you haven't read your Bible before, it's important. Why? Because, listen, this is not the argument, and I'm not going to get into this today because it's not the key to this first chapter of Genesis, but the whole creation-evolution argument. But the problem that most Darwinian evolutionists have is, I mean, they can talk about all kinds of different things, and they do, and there's a lot of good science in that. Please don't hear me wrong. But the one thing they cannot explain and will avoid is how something came from nothing. They can't. Why? Well, obviously because it can't. (laughs) Something cannot come from nothing. If you want to call it an agent, a force, or God, some intelligent being, purposeful, intelligent being, had to have created what we see here today. This is the story of God. This is who he is and what he's done. And as we go on in our text, we're going to learn something more about this plural Elohim. Look at verse 2. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So the heavens and the earth were created, and then from this text, we learn some very interesting aspects of what God created and how he did it. So first, the earth was formless. So not a lot of bumps and mountains. It was formless. It was void. This one verse could honestly, we we could, and I I did when we planted the Rock Church uh, 10 years ago, we spent uh, three months (laughs) in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Why? Because we had to get those three chapters right starting as a church. And so I could spend a lot of time on this one verse with you. We don't have time for that today. But let me just put it to you this way. Having established the heavens and the earth, literally the land, that word earth could literally be translated as land, made out of nothing, we learn that there was this key. It's lifeless at that point in time. There's no life. It's without form. It's void. And listen, it remained that way until the Spirit of God moved. That's the picture that God, through the writer and author Moses, wants you and I to see and understand. And so we see this plurality is God, Father, God, Spirit, right there in the opening verses of our Scripture. And as the Spirit moves, he leads us to the introduction of another person in this plurality. Verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. I've often said this, and this is a subject we can get into some other time. You know, up until this point in time, creationists, Christians, and evolutionists are on exactly the same page, right? It's a big bang. Let there be light. There's an explosion of light. That's what the Bible says. It's actually very clear that it says that. But also it tells us this. The story of God is about a God who speaks. You know, I saw another cartoon uh, this past week. I should have got it and put it up. It's kind of corny. There's a guy on his knees, right? And he's crying, God, I just want to hear your voice. 
And then there's a picture of a hand coming out of a cloud going, here you go. <laughs> I know it's corny, but come on. It's not because I'm old I think that way. I think, it's, I think it's, it's, we need to see it this way. This is the way God speaks to us. And he, listen, also, we'll see this next week, of course, that we're going to see that the one who speaks is the word of God, and his name is Jesus. He's Jesus. In the Bible, the word of God, the apostle John is going to show us next week this in John 1, 3, says this, all things, all things, not just a few things, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made speaking of Jesus. So listen, right here in the first three verses of the Bible, the story of God, we have an early, early, early picture of what? Something that doesn't even become a reality to the people of Israel until the time of Jesus arriving on this earth and then Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is sent out. It's a picture of the Trinity of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, first five verses. Does the reference chart make any more sense now? It's, it's, it's uncanny how this happens. And God places in his word the hint, the, the foreshadowing of that right there. And of course, as we've already said, I've already suggested at this point, there's this great explosion of light and much more takes place from that point on, which we do not have time to cover today. You can go back nine years and listen to the podcasts if you want, or we can get into that some other time. Happy to talk to you about that. But I want to move on to this other last bit of the scripture that we looked at this morning before getting to our second point, and it is this. Verses 4 and 5 say this, and God, look, saw. He just doesn't speak things. He just doesn't move. He's looking. He's watching his own creation. This is our God. This is who he is. He saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, evening, and there was morning the first day. So listen, this might not sound like an important detail for some of you here today, but it was one of the details that clued C.S. Lewis in. Do you notice it? Do you notice that this is not the way a human author would start a book on a dark and stormy night? Why why do I say that? Well, look at it. It's completely in the reverse of even up until that time when when stories were being told in the days of Moses, people didn't start with, and it was evening and morning were a day. It was morning and evening were a day. And so the question has to be, why, why, (laughs) why would God have Moses record it that way? Because that's odd. C.S. Lewis saw that and he went, no, that's odd. It should be morning and evening. That's a day to us, isn't it? No, it was evening and morning were the first day. Well, for two reasons, I believe, scholars believe, he had Moses write it this way. Number one reason, number one reason, because it's true. Because that's how it happened. Totally counter what we would think, but that's how God works. Even more importantly, theologically, in reality, it speaks to us about who he is. God always brings light into darkness. Why? Because he's light. That's who he is. First five verses. First five verses. This unpacks a lot of theology. These guys go crazy, okay? And so do I, obviously, because there's a lot here. Now, how are you going to know that? How are you going to know? Do you have to read all these books? You're probably going, please, no. <laughs> no. Well, you could come to church and have someone preach and teach it to you, and then you could go and read it for yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to, to guide you more deeply in it, and you could go into community group with other believers in the church, and you could learn more and learn more. And, I mean, someone was talking to me today about, you know, like they saw me walking into all the books and go, you know, like, how, how do you keep fresh? How do you keep up to date? And I'm like, you know, I've got to keep at it. But here's the thing, and, and, and I'm not saying this out of feigned humility. I know this to be absolutely 100% true. Two things. One, I'm in the Word of God more than probably anyone in this room every week. I should be. It's my job, right? It's what I'm called to do. But second of all, I would say this with truth. I still feel like I'm skimming the surface. I still feel like, and I said to one man earlier today, I still feel a little bit frightened to get up here on Sunday morning that I might say something wrong. That's a good position to be in, by the way. 
This is the word of God. So second point for you today as we're going to get to our conclusion shortly, believe me. What has he done? Who he is is what we've looked at. What has he done? Well, we could say that much of what we've actually been looking at is partly about what he's done in creation, right? Of course. But, but here we want to focus on what he has done after he has finished his good work of creation. Now, most of you know the, the, the way the rest of the chapter goes, right? The next five days of creation, God keeps creating things, you know, animals and plants and he, the heavens and the stars and the, moon, the more lights, right? There's the great light in the beginning, but then there's the, the moon and the stars and the planets and everything else are being created out of this explosion that takes place under his hand. I knew I'd do it. And, right? and, and so it's happening. Finally, on the last day, after all of that, actually every day after that, he keeps saying at the end of every day, it's good. He's pretty proud of his own work. You know, I, I would be too if I was able to make these things happen. But he says it's good. Then he gets to the last day, the sixth day, And God, listen, God says this in verse 26. Then God said, now here's the evidence again for you about Elohim. It's right there in the text. Let us, who is he talking to? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then let them, and as we'll see later, there's male and female. So there's two of them, at least to start have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I've always said whenever we read that, like this word dominion doesn't mean pillage and plunder, Christian. (laughs) It, It means stewardship. Of all the things that God has created, all the good things, we're supposed to take care of them. The best environmentalists on the planet should be Christians. goes on to say, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And there's that them. Then finally in verse 31, it says this, which is great. And God once again saw everything, everything. The cosmos, planet Earth, the only place in the cosmos where we know there is somewhat intelligent life. That he had made, and behold, it was now very good. It says something about who you and I are. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Is this not a good story? Come on, right? This is a great story. Too bad it didn't end there. It's the story of God. Can you imagine if it had ended there? Well, in the next chapter, we learn many more details about the man and the woman, and there's this beautiful garden that God provided for them, and in this garden was everything. It's a smorgasbord. Like, they didn't have to really work for anything like my wife and I do, or I do now, trying to help her, you know, like harvest all of the craziness that she's going, got going on in our garden, which is beautiful and nuts, right? But it's like, and we have nuts, figs, and it's, it's everywhere, right? But, but they, had, they didn't... They, 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 They didn't have clothes. They just walked around and go, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And they not only had everything they ever needed, there was no sickness. There was no death. And they had God. Fellowship with their creator God every day. Walking with them in the garden, speaking with them, the scripture teaches us. But you know what? Sadly for them, and let's be honest, we would have done the same thing. That's the story of the gospel, by the way. We would have done things. For them, it was, listen, not good enough. They bought the ridiculous lie that, that if they would just do this one thing that God commanded, one thing that God commanded them not to do, they could be like him. And therefore, if they're like him, we don't need him anymore. It's tragedy. It's tragic. That sin, that fall, brought death and destruction to God's good, good creation. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I might if I was God. <laughs> like, and maybe some of you would feel the same way. But after going to all that trouble, providing all that, you know, all this goodness, all my love, all, and going to all the work of creation, however long you believe God took to do that, and putting it there and going, there, this is for you. After all that, and then, and then, You do that? I don't know. I might have just said, let them die. A little harsh? 
not God. What does he do? Well, he goes looking for Adam. Hey, Adam, where are you? What are you doing? Why are you hiding? What do you, what do you got a fig leaf on for? We don't know if that's what it was, but shame, guilt, sin. The story of God can also be seen through these four, four words, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Listen, our God, you know what he does? Genesis 3.15 I won't put it on screen. He's he, speaking to the serpent, says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm promising right now that I'm going to give a woman a son, and one day he's going to crush your head. And you know what? My creation is going to be redeemed and restored, and so are my people. So the story of God begins with a desire to provide a land for a people, Right? That's what Genesis 1 is really about at its core. Yes, there's other stuff which we can get into. It's about providing a land for his people, that they would be his people and that he would be their God and live happily ever after. This is a good story. It's a wonderful story, especially considering he's such a good God. And so the story of God from the beginning and especially after the rebellion against God is also seen, as I said, in those four words, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. He knew this would happen. And yet he created us. Wow. So God sets out to redeem and restore his people and the land. He makes promises after promises. He starts with that first promise. And then he keeps making promises. And here's the deal. Read the Bible. Read the references. Read the arcs. Every promise he makes, he keeps to the most finite detail. He's a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. He's a covenant-maker. So he promises his people, the people of Israel, what? A promised land, right? It just, it doesn't stop as he, as he seeks to redeem these unfaithful Jewish people who we are just like, he promises them a land. And what's going to happen in that land? He promises them that he will, he will be there with them. He will be their God and they will be his people. And he tries that with them. But he also promises that he will send a redeemer, a savior who will redeem and restore his whole creation. Jesus, the son of God, comes, of course, fulfilling that promise in the most perfect way. He lives the perfect life that you and I cannot live. He dies the death on the cross in your place and for your sins that you and I deserve. And then what does he do? He gives us the free gift of salvation and the kingdom and eternity again with our Father, which we clearly do not deserve. I don't deserve it. I don't know about you. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Then Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you and I during this time in history, to sanctify us, to prepare a people for God, for a place, for eternity. It's still part of the plan. It's still going on. Right? He's going to accomplish the redemption and restoration of all of his creation. All of this takes place over a period of approximately so far to this day, six to 8,000 years in recorded history. That's not long. How long before he returns? So listen, the story of God is all true. All of his promise, promises, read them for yourself, have been kept to the most finite detail. This is what he has done. This is what he's done. Now listen, you know when a story begins, a book starts within the beginning, that there must be at the end, right? There has to be at the end, right? It's crazy. You saw the arcs that were on the screen, right? It, it, it keeps going. Now listen, I, I'm going to read for you the second last chapter the first few verses of the second last chapter. See where it is? Like, so what's happened since Genesis is pretty much all of this has happened, right, in there. And, and there's actually more because there's, like, there's Acts, you know, 19, right? Like 29, pardon me, for our life today in the church. These are the words of the last book of the Bible in the 21st chapter. And this is the Apostle John who knew Jesus, who wrote the Gospel of John, and he's been taken up into heaven so Jesus can give him the revelation about how this story of God is going to end. And he starts with these words. I'll put some of this on screen for you. It says this, John writing, Then I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, the bride being the church, Jesus being the husband. New Testament teaches us this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, the throne of the kingdom of God, which would be the voice of Jesus. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That was the plan. was always the plan. He's going to make it happen again. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yes, George. Yes, Joyce. He'll wipe away every tear. And death shall be no more. Amen. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. I who made everything in the first place am going to make everything new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The word of God, which we'll look at more in depth next week. And finally, he said, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God. And he will be my son and my daughter, my children. So over this long period of time, the story of God tells us that Jesus is going to provide us with a new land and a new earth, a perfected land and a perfected earth for what? For a perfected people. You're not perfect today, Christian. You know that. If you're not a Christian today, you're not perfect. You should know that. But that's the whole process of, quote, sanctification, being in Christ, in the Word, and being trained up and being sanctified, being made holy by God for this eternal time in the future. So, friends, let me just suggest this to you. The story of God tells us that it's not just really, it's not about us, is it? The story of God's not about us at all. It's about God and ultimately about God in the flesh. But listen, the Bible also tells us this very good news. You and I are not a mistake. We're, we're not a fluke of random natural selection. We're not. Whatever you want to impose on Genesis 1, cannot impose that because that's not who you are or who we are. We are made in the image of our creator God and listen, you, we are wanted We are wanted by him. We are the planned offspring of the God of love, and he longs to share his life, his possessions, his kingdom with us. Do you not want to be there and be part of that story, friend? You can. You need to do two things. You need to trust the Holy Spirit's prompting in your heart and your life that what you hear is trustworthy and true. You need to believe in him, that he died on the cross in your place for your sins, and that based on that and that alone, you can be forgiven and invited to be part of this new story that's going to take place. I'll leave you this morning with a challenge, and I'm going to come back to this challenge next week. It's a serious challenge. Now, I know pastors are not supposed to lay wagers or bets, but I'm going to put a bet on this, okay? Here's the challenge. Go home today. Start tomorrow morning in the Gospel of John and just read one chapter. Put your devotionals away. Put all your podcasts away. Put all your books away. Read the Gospel of John where we're going to start next week. Chapter one. Just read it. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Stop when you're hearing something. Read it over again. Look at it. It'll take 10 minutes and then leave it. Now, here's my challenge. Here's my bet. If you do that, 
over the next 30 days? I'm going to bet this. It's like the old Lay's potato chip commercial. I bet you can't just eat one. (laughs) And have one of these with you, by the way. Have it open. I'm going to bet this, that by the time you get to the 15th or 20th day, you're going to find yourself reading two chapters, maybe three. Would that not be good news in your life today? I think it would be very good news, church, for every single one of us. Pray with me, would you?